Welcome back to Swiss Watch Expo. This is Taking Time. I'm Jonathan. This is Richard. So we're doing something very controversial and awesome at the same time. Uh, one of our favorite types of watches, dive watches. So we're going over dive watches today. Right. Uh, what are they? Well, what are they? Well, they're, they're, they're a tool watch that a lot of people use to scuba dive. And, and nowadays, most people aren't using it to scuba dive. Most people are just wearing it as a general, general wear and tear watch, right? But and the, these are an applicable use uh, machine. You know, they are built specifically designed to do a, do a purpose. And, mm -hmm. they're, they're, and nowadays, they're significantly more powerful than they used to be. Um, you know, it's, it ranges all the way from, you know, in the early 1900s, from the very first water-resistant watch all the way up to what we have now, which is, a, you know, kind of the pinnacle, which is the James Cameron Deep Sea. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that Yeah, we'll, we'll get a little more into that. Yeah. But so, you know, I guess we, you know, let's start by, like, getting into the features of the, the, uh, of, of the watches. Now, I just want to say for the viewers, you know, this is a very subjective uh, analysis of this. There's obviously some other components that would go into this, but we've we're not but, clearly experts. Yeah, yeah, we're not. You know, but we've we've picked out five things that we kind of feel are the quintessential elements to a dive piece. Yeah. Um, and so we've kind of picked out the pieces that we have as well that kind of uh, you know embody those things as well. So again, it's it's very subjective. You know, and we know that there's there's different opinions of this. Like Jonathan has said, this is very controversial. Yeah. But oh. And that brings up a good point. I do want to, uh, you know, prove a point here. Uh, you know, a dive watch is not afraid to get wet. Right. So I wear a dive watch. Wear a Tudor Black Bay the steel. So, so the watch isn't afraid, but are you? No. Uh, no. I don't <laughs> not at all. <laughs> well, well, right. Right. It's water resistant. Power, power to the brave. <laughs> so, anyways, let's go over. So, a quick rundown. Uh, I think we're going to do like the different features and everything. Okay. So let's start with, I guess, the crown. Okay. So, I mean, from what I understand is that, you know, the crown kind of the quintessential dive watch that we see now has a screw down crown. There's other, there's obviously other, other elements people have used to make a watch water resistant, but you know, I kind of started with the screw down count crown and the screw down case, which happened in 1926 or so with Rolex with the oyster case. Yeah. Um, you know, the idea that the case back screws down and the crown screws down as well. Um, Rolex didn't own that patent at the beginning. He, he actually borrowed the Hans Waldorf borrowed that from someone else. But, you know, that kind of came with the, the original Oyster case, uh, which kind of evolved into the Submariner nowadays. But, you know, that's, that's kind of where it started. And now what you see is a, most of the time pieces that are considered to be dive pieces have a screw down crown. Yeah. You know, there are obviously some exceptions. Kind of like the hallmark of like one of the requirements right, is right. having a screw down crown. What we mean by screw down crown is that you actually unscrew it counterclockwise, right. you know, lefty loosey ray tidy. Right. Uh, it does create a seal against the actual case. Right. And it's got to get, it's got a rubber gasket in there to seal it against the case. Cause obviously metal and metal doesn't seal very well by itself. So, you know, th those, those, uh, those improvements have happened over the, over the ages with different variations and as technologies improved and so forth and so on. Um, then we kind of go to the, the thicker crystal. I think that's kind of like the next component that we're, we, we kind of see as the being that's the second quintessential um, component of the dive watch. Yeah, I think Omega was the one that kind of like pioneered that with the Omega Marine. It's a really cool watch. I wish they would come out. It's yeah, like and ho hopefully the tech team will cut a, put a picture on it. I don't yeah. know if they can. They're probably going to hurt yeah, us for doing it. Yeah, you could. But if you could, just oh, plaster a big old uh, uh, Omega Marine right in front of our faces yeah. right now. So really everybody can see cool what we're watch. talking about. But really yeah, neat watch. It had a double plane, <coughs> excuse me, uh, plexiglass crystal. And we don't have, obviously, the watch here. Right. It's from the 30s. Oh, man, I can't imagine how much that'd be worth. Yeah, uh, but anyways, so our best representation of an overbuilt, robust version <laughs> of that is the Omega Ploprov, which is really cool because it has, you know, also another engineered feat, which is a uh, locking bezel. So right. this will not turn without this button pushed. So it does turn, uh, you know, which is another feature of the dive watch that uh, makes it a dive watch is the right. bezel. Right. And, you know, the, the original ones didn't have anything. That, they didn't have any bezels at all. They didn't have any time capabilities. In fact, they didn't even have any way for you to really see the watch when it went underwater. And the first few were actually kind of untested. Even the Rolex, the very first Rolex submarine was kind of untested. Uh, it was tested a little bit when 
I'm going to mess up her name. Her name is Mer Mercedes. Benz? No. <laughs> her name was Mercedes. If you guys know her na last name, feel free to put it down in the comments. I forgot her name. But she swam across the English Channel, and Hans Woldorf had the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. It was where, essentially, Rolex kind of, like, That's secured being water resistant. Again, teaching us is not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> <laughs> Rolex keeps repeating this, so... Um, you know, so he had the wherewithal to tell her to put it on her, her wrist. She swam across the English Channel 10 miles. And then, you know, the watch kept perfect time and never got water in it. So it, t it turned out to be a very quintessential piece. But it wasn't proven to be a dive watch yet. And the Omega uh, was the first one that actually did prove to go underneath the yeah. water. And but it wasn't seven, a dive watch either. It wasn't a dive watch either. More like a JLC yeah, or yeah. so. <laughs> exactly. It looked very similar. And, you know, you, it went down 73 meters, if I'm correct. 70, 73 meters, uh, I think, is the official rating for the first one. Um, so that one was tested. But if you did go down that deep, you couldn't really see it. So the, the next point of technology that we kind of see to be the quintessential element of a dive watch is the illumination. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes with Panerai. Uh, we didn't have a good uh, interpretation of a radio mirror because they don't use radium anymore. And right. that's where the line radio mirror actually kind of gets its name from. Right. Was It was really the first brand to really use uh, purposely uh, radium, which is actually a very dangerous radioactive right. material. So if you do your research, the radium girls, horrible, horrible, tragic, yeah. uh, you know, circumstance that happened. But, you know, radium was used and Panerai really contributed to the now evolved dive watch, you know, right. using luminescence. Right. And radium was really like the first luminescence used. Right. And then, you know, in later years, the technology improved. They stopped trying to, you know, they stopped hurting people. And then they tra they, they changed to the tritium. But it, it is it is notable to say that I mean, the, the Panerai was the first luminescent watch that you could see underwater if you went mm -hmm. any significant depth. And, you know, it, it also like merits to say that a lot of the developments in these pieces, especially coming from the Panerai, came from sort of the military use of the dive watch and the frogmen. You guys can do your research. that We can do an entire video on, on just how that kind of worked. But it was built for the Italian military. So, you know, they built the radio mirror, not this one. They built the radio mirror specifically for that, uh, for that purpose. And the other thing that, uh, you know, kind of what we're talking about, the screw down crown. The other thing that Panerai did that was really, really neat was they, they created this locking mechanism for the crown. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit different than the screw down crown, but it's still significant. Because it is a different design, and other people have used it before. Like Hublot's used a similar situation where they lock it down with a lever as a, yeah, you know, versus yeah. a crown. So you know, other people have kind of picked up on that and uh, and held it to their own as well. And you know, I, I'm kind of curious because it looks like they actually they implemented this in the 1950 Luminor. Yeah, that's that's where it kind of gets its name. That's why we still call it the 1950. Um, but now our pieces still say patent pending yeah, on the crown sometimes. So yeah, and we don't know. We're not why. sure why. But if you guys do, uh, feel free to put it down in the comments. Uh, we didn't get that information prior to making the video. But if you guys know, please feel free to let us know because we are kind of curious about that. Because it's been it's been patented since 1956. And it could be, you know, America's patents end after... Anyway, whatever. You guys tell us what, what you guys think about that because uh, you're, we're very curious to know. Yeah. Um, so and speaking of military use, um, you know, Blanc Pond really came out with like the first true right. version of what a dive watch is. Like the model of what everybody's kind of using nowadays, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah with the 50 Fathoms. Sort of this isn't something. like the true uh, 50 Fathoms or anything, but it is a chronograph, but it does have essentially like everything that, right. you know, a dive watch would have. I mean, it has the unidirectional bezel. It and this is the screw. first implementation of the unidirectional bezel, I believe. So that's, the, yeah. that's actually our... Our fourth component, uh, yeah. as far as the dive watch, okay, uh, you know, having that, uh, for, we forgot to introduce that, but it, that is the fourth component, you know. So the unidirectional, my, my bad, I interrupted you. Guys. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is uh, essentially like what a dive watch has evolved and is sticking to today. You know, it's uh, really just a classic design, and right. I mean, there's just something about a dive watch. It's just, you know, it's masculine. It's Right you now, beefy, yeah, <laughs> old, yeah, strong, heavy. You know, it's it's just it's just got the weight of uh, of a of substantial piece. Yeah, and then you know, Blanc Pond also did do a few variations for different military units. Uh, Rolex yes. uh, provided some some Mariners. You ever heard of the Mil Sub? Yeah, um, yeah, very 
sought after piece. I would love to give my right arm for a Millsop, <laughs> but uh, just like your watch, right? Yeah. <laughs> like no, I mean I, I, that's why I give the right arm so, <laughs> so I can, can still, still wear, wear it. Watch. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah. Um, essentially, yeah. Dive watches have had since Blancpain really kind of like came out with the overall design a big influence in history going forward and right. haven't really changed a whole lot. No, not, not it's a whole lot. It's kind of like the crocodile. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they've, they've definitely, you know, the 50 Fathoms was originally able, it was meet, it was rated at 300 meters. Yeah. Um, so it was a one fathom is six, six feet. If you multiply that by 30, you get 300. Or uh, 300 feet. So 100 meters when it originally came out. Now, obviously, we've surpassed that mm -hmm. at this point, but they still kind of pay homage to the original piece and call it the 50 Fathoms. But obviously, yeah. this can go significantly deeper than that. But then from there, I think, you know, we, we kind of evolved a little bit further because, you know, going that, that far is one thing, but we've completely kind of surpassed what the, the watches of the ages have done, which leads us kind of to the James Cameron. Yeah, James Cameron. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> this piece is really kind of like the quintessential uh, hallmark of essentially what all the technology is kind of built up to. Right. Um, this piece actually was strapped to, I think, one of the arms or some aspect of the uh, submersible that James Cameron actually right. took down. James Cameron is a director, producer. I think he made Terminator 2, made mm -hmm. Avatar. Yep. And this is named uh, you know, after him because he gave away his Submariner that he wore for like 20 years. Right. And um, Rolex uh, heard about that and wanted to get with him to do this to really show off again you know like mercedes swam across the channel right you know they really wanted to show that their pieces are not just you know no, they're pretty. not just for show you know they yeah. are tool watches yeah so used. they actually strapped uh you know the watch they didn't overbuild it they didn't super pressurize it or anything like that they literally strapped it to the submersible and took it down to eleven thousand feet with it still running right came back up and it was still running <laughs> significantly farther than 100 meters of the Blanc Pond yeah. and everything before it. And, um, you know, this one, this one implemented what we consider to be like the fifth quintessential component of a true dive watch. Not every dive watch has this, but if you're going, if you're going to get extreme, yeah, then essentially you're going to have to have the helium escape valve, yeah, which we see on the side of the case. Um, Omega uh, originally, when they started doing their helium escape valve, was a manual release. And they kind of they still stick to that as a sort of a heritage uh, and an homage to the original traditional pieces as well. But a lot of these cases we're seeing now, they have the healing escape valve, which is automated, essentially automates the healing escape process. Well, you know why? Because why? Uh, well, essentially, uh, saturation divers go down for extended periods of time. Right. You know, they go down for like a week, sometimes more, um, and whenever they're in their what what's called like a diving bell it's actually going to be like filled with helium and they have to breathe like a helium oxygen mixture right so whenever they come back up and repressurize helium is lighter than air so it has to escape somehow Makes so sense. the crystals were actually popping off of like the submariners and rolex came out with the helium escape valve to actually let the helium escape hmm. learn something new today yeah thanks for that man all right, so that's kind of like, you know, that's that's sort of the end of our brief overview of the, the dive watches, and we're going to kind of do what we sort of do at the all, end of all of our videos. Uh, if you had to pick one, what's your favorite? You know, I think I'm going to actually go bold this time with the <laughs> Omega Plo Prof. It's a pretty sweet beast. Like, it's it's awesome. It's actually the like, first shark-proof watch, too. Right? <laughs> so, you know, this thing's going to be able to actually... You might lose a hand, but the watch will be fine. Yeah. I might lose my right arm. <laughs> What about you? I, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm going to go with the Blanc Pond. I think it, it's, it's got it's got a mixture of elegance, um, mixed with mixed with uh, utilitarian use. And I, I just I love the I love the bezel. This is different than any a lot of the stuff you're seeing nowadays. Yeah, you, know, you see the ceramic bezels, and um, and I just I really like the way this one's done. I like how dressy it is. You can wear this with any suit if you wanted to. To be honest with you, I mean you can wear it for any party, and I, no one's going to be mad at you for wearing it in shorts and slippers. Well, sandals. <laughs> Man, um, Maybe a suit on top. <laughs> going out to the front porch and getting the newspaper and slippers and spray. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to go with the Blanc Pond. You know, so that's it for us. You guys let us know what's your favorite. Um, you know, tell us, tell us what you thought about it. Tell us what you think about dive watches. If you guys own it, if you guys use it to dive, you know, if you guys are just using it for fun, recreation, or you guys use it in the pool. 
Um, you know, get back and talk to us. Oh, yeah, and leave Penny down in the comments. Below. Oh, yeah, because we still want Penny to come on here one of these days. So, yeah. Penny on the comments if you want Penny to show up one of these days. She's sort of like our unicorn. <laughs> That's all from us. All right.